Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the ninth annual California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Um, uh, yeah. We're back live again. We're back live. And um, uh, this conference has, has quite a history. Um, and it started nine years ago when my colleague and I were just sitting around and said, we'd like to know what's going on at other universities in entrepreneurship around California. So he said, let's create a California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. And so we invited a number of our colleagues from different California schools to come and showcase what they were doing special in the area of entrepreneurship on, on their campuses, and that's what we envisioned. It would be a California thing. Um, but that first conference, I don't know how word got out, but word got out, and we had people come from all over the country. Uh, we had uh, people come from other parts of the world, and somehow they found their way here. And so when we thought about the second year of that conference, we said maybe we should drop California from the name and just call it the Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. And um, so we did some focus groups, and people said, no, no, keep California in the name. And so we kept California in the name, even though now we are truly a global conference. And we have people uh, visiting us from Europe, from, uh, from Canada, from Mexico, from uh, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, uh, a number of other countries. It's uh, too many to list. So, uh, But we are thrilled that this has turned into a global conference and uh, that you find your way here uh, for our California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. It's truly uh, a special conference, and it's, um, it was originally designed, it was originally designed to, um, uh, the year that I served as president of USASB, uh, we wanted to drum up um, uh, participation in the, in the USASB conference that would take place here in San Diego in 2016. And so we thought about it that way. And uh, so this, this conference and Julianne Shields back there, our president of our national association, the United, USASB. Um, this has always been a USASB themed kind of an event to get people excited about it. So you'll hear more about USASB um, as, as the day goes on. So, Welcome to the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. We tried our best to keep registration fees as reasonable as possible. And the way we're able to do that is because of uh, some of our wonderful sponsors. So if you see anyone from these different schools and so forth, thank them for their financial support. Uh, our dean at the Fowler College of Business at San Diego State. and. Uh, uh, our good friends at the um, University of Southern California, Alyssa, Jill, and uh, the USC team, thank you so much for supporting this event at, um, at our platinum level, so thank you. I want to thank our gold sponsors, um, uh, BizStarts. Uh, you'll hear some things about BizStarts. Uh, they're, um, they're based in Wisconsin, and they're a pioneer in our uh, um, our Urban Poverty Business Initiative program that you'll hear from Michael Morris tomorrow. Um, and um, uh, my good friend Patrick Snyder, who is the, runs Biz Starts, was the executive director when we put our conference on here. And Patrick's been a good friend. Where are our Biz Starts people here? Oh, they were on Baja yesterday and they didn't make it today. Okay, we're going to have to talk to Patrick about that. Um, and our own at San Diego State, our Wendy Gillespie Center for Advancing Global Business. Um, uh, our good friends uh, supported us. We got a lot of support from our different facets of SDSU this year, so I was really happy to see that. Um, and our silver sponsors, um, you know, I mean, again, our, our Mission Valley Innovation District, uh, if you want to learn anything what's happening here, when we lost the Chargers, um, 
San Diego State gained an amazing new space that is going to be an incredible innovation district um, uh, that is in the making. The first thing that went up is our football stadium, but uh, now the innovation district will begin to unfold, and uh, so I thank them. And uh, our fellow CSU members is Mark Monahan here from Cal State San Marcos, and, uh, and then our good friends at Fresno State. Um, Emil, uh, thank you so much. My counterpart, uh, Emil Milosevic from um, Fresno State, um, thank you as a silver sponsor of our event. And um, our Baja experience was sponsored. We had an amazing trip yesterday. Uh, thank you to Cal State East Bay for uh, their, their wonderful support of that event. And Joe, thank you, representing Cal State East Bay. We really, really appreciate that. And our bronze sponsors, uh, you Sosby, Julianne, thank you for um, all of your support. And um, uh, my good friend Francisco Velez uh, from CETIS University. And they'll have eight faculty here from uh, CETIS throughout throughout the conference, and we're so pleased to have you part of this. And then a very, very special one. Uh, several years ago, our student that was running this conference now has her own event planning business, uh, uh, Tammy Nguyen over here. And she said, we hired her to be the, the help us with our new staff to run it, but um, uh, Tammy said, I want to be a sponsor this year. So tw Tammy Nguyen, event planning. So if any of you are planning events, there's your, there's your lady. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> so uh, there, those sponsors, uh, I can't say enough. Um, thank you for making this happen. Um, and our amazing organizers, um, let me tell you something. You're going to see a very professionally run conference, I'm sure, uh, over the next couple of days. And um, this crew here, most of them are doing this for the first time. Uh, they're, they're juniors and seniors in our program, and they just embraced it. And there's so many people here. You'll see them throughout. Uh, when you see them, thank them for uh, a year's worth of planning. Uh, on this, uh, for this conference to happen. And um, they're true professionals now. So Sarah, Anna, and the rest of the crew, thank you so much. And then we're going to try to capture some interesting videography. We've got the still cameras for any speakers that want to do it, uh, that want to record uh, their session. But then we've got our um, we've got a film crew out. They'll be interviewing you throughout the conference. So uh, uh, when they pull you aside, uh, tell them your experiences here at the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. And uh, this is, you can see the size of our team that has really put in a major effort. Um, so the way our conference is organized, it's, uh, it's we're in 15 minute chunks. Okay, five zero, um, and this is known as Aztec One. The room over here is Aztec Two, right adjacent to us, and then around the corner, uh, we'll use those rooms mostly tomorrow, uh, Aztec Three and Four. We just came up with some simple names, and uh, uh, you'll see the schedule of what's happening in each of the rooms throughout the day. Just look at the sign right outside the rooms and pick, your, um, pick the sessions that you'd like to attend. So that's how our conference is organized. And um, uh, if you have any questions, there's Sarah and Anna that will, uh, and the rest of our team. Uh, watch for the team wearing those California Entrepreneurship Educator shirts and uh, uh, they're here to answer any of your questions. So um, let's get started with our, with our opening keynote. A longtime friend of mine and um, former president of USASB um, is Jill Kickle. And when I asked Jill to come and deliver our opening keynote, um, uh, Jill's never 
turned me down on something on a request like this and today was no different. So uh, Jill, I'm so happy to have you here today. There's quite a bio, but I'm just gonna give you a, just a little snippet so that I can turn this over to Jill. Uh, Jill Kickle joined USC Marshall School uh, of Business in August 2016 as a professor in the Lloyd Grief Center for Entrepreneurial Studies and Research. Um, she, is, um, she was the director of the Social Entrepreneurship Program at NYU. And prior to joining NYU, Jill was um, uh, the Richard A. Forsyth Chair of Entrepreneurship at the Thomas C. Page Center for Entrepreneurship at Miami University. And there's <laughs> a, a, a reading a mile long, but I think most people in this room uh, know our good friend, Jill Kickle. So yeah, come on up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So Alex, congratulations. I can't believe it's the ninth annual. Um, and I know you're retiring, but you have to come back for the 10th annual, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I also want to thank Sarah and Tammy. Anna, Tammy, you guys are amazing to put on a conference. And many of you who put on conferences, you can definitely appreciate all the work behind the scenes that goes into putting on a conference. So uh, congratulations, yeah. And Alex, I just wanna say, I know this is your last year at San Diego State, and you have been an inspiration to so many of us. I remember back in the day, and citing you, if you remember this paper that you had at Babson, and it was on entrepreneurial self-efficacy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that work really just inspired a lot of our work in the field and with intentions and everything. So thank you. And I, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you do have to come back for the 10th annual for sure. For sure. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, I did not go on the Baja um, trip. I probably should have, maybe. I'm not much of a morning person. Um, and this talk actually today is really inspired uh, from some of my work that I've been doing in the social entrepreneurship field. Um, I've been teaching uh, entrepreneurship uh, for about 30 years. I started, had my first course in 1993. Um, and I've been teaching social entrepreneurship for the last 15 years. And more recently, um, I've had the opportunity to go back and teach in the traditional fundamentals of entrepreneurship classroom. And what I'm finding is that, and you may be finding this in your classrooms too as well, is that almost half of the students have some type of societal kind of lens impact factor within the ventures that they're looking to start, okay? And it begs the question also, as, a, as a, one of the entrepreneurship professors um, at USC Marshall and the Greif Center, I've been asked also a lot of times to come into some of those fundamental courses, those very first introductory courses, to do a module on social entrepreneurship. And usually, it's kind of a little bit of an afterthought. I'm usually like the last module <laughs> of the course. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is really talk about a little bit, you know, what are some of the different kind of themes that I've seen in social entrepreneurship and some of the tools and some of the techniques that we have used in the field, in the pretty much a nascent field, but how can we incorporate some of the things we've learned in social entrepreneurship education within the traditional entrepreneurship classroom, your traditional fundamentals class, okay? And so that's really kind of some of the observations. So why should we really care? Why should we really care about thinking about uh, bringing some of the social issues into our classrooms? And you know, first and foremost, I mean, AACSB, their new policies um, and new principles that they have out there, they often talk about that the new principles states that business education is a force for good, okay? And they also talk about how do we embed societal impact within all our different types of course offerings, all our curricular offerings, co-curricular offerings, how do we can actually do that within our experiential exercises and what have you? 
Um, and they also ask in the begging question, and this is both at the faculty level and also at the student level, is that burning question, what have you done to create societal impact? Okay, and it's at the faculty level in terms of maybe the research that we're doing, but it's also what we're also doing within our courses too, and really rethinking um, about that. Okay. They also state, and they do give some guiding uh, principles and tools, um, if you will, that have been out there for quite some time. Um, they look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals to transform our world, and they say that this might be a good framework to start from in terms of looking at how we, how we embed society and impact within our courses. Okay. Um, many of you are very familiar with EM Lyon Business School in France. Um, they have a really great entrepreneurship program. Um, they do every year, um, they take one uh, SDG goal basically, and they try to embed it within what they're doing with their events, within their conferences, um, just within all their different partnerships. And students arrive on campus day one, essentially having kind of a toolkit for that one uh, SDG goal that they're gonna be working on uh, for the year. Uh, also a really good tool out of Sweden, out of the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development. They have a free assessment tool that you can actually use. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how you can use that tool within the classroom. So when students are thinking about SDGs, um, they can really think through in terms of how they plan it out, how they map out some of their goals, and how they measure some of their impact. Okay. So what does this also mean for uh, implications for entrepreneurship and also what the, what the literature has been saying about this? Uh, so Mike Wright and, and Shakur Zara, many of you know uh, both of them, um, they have an article, a 2016 article in uh, Journal of Management Science talking a little bit more about how we should really look at entrepreneurship that should solve societal problems by bringing positive externalities that have social implications. And they look at in terms of we should really be looking at the social value of entrepreneurship as an intentional action, okay? In instead of seeing them as kind of like uh, a, a by cause, if you will, of the commercial process. And they also talk, give some insights too in that JMS article um, about how you can really rethink also the research that's being done, and it gives a different types of lens when you, com when, you, uh, when you blend both the commercial and also the societal. Okay. They also talk about in this article, they have five pillars of what, what they say is the evolving role of entrepreneurship and can have its impact. And I just want to point out two here um, that I think are, are pretty important. And one is really connecting, how do we connect the entrepreneurial activities that we do to basically things that we look at in terms of the quality of life? How do we achieve progress within society? How do we help communities prosper? How do we help individuals and families succeed? Um, and then they also talk about uh, pursuing a blended value. So really a blended value of the creation of the financial, the social, the environmental. And the whole idea is that wealth is, is really a blended array of many different things, just not economic. And so we need to look at that a little bit further. And they say this is crucial to developing a sustainable kind of quality, holistic quality of life. Okay. And so this is not anything new. If you're talking to practitioners in the field and you're listening to kind of what they've been saying throughout in the years that I've been teaching social entrepreneurship and in the field, holding events, holding conferences, um, we are now at our 20th annual uh, research conference on social entrepreneurship. So we've been doing this quite some time. Um, but what we see from practitioners who come into our conferences and the dialogue and the conversations that we have with them, this is not new. They speak this language all the time. And if you go way back to Jed Emerson back in the 2000s, he was talking about this idea of blended value, especially at the very heyday, or the start, <laughs> heyday and start, of impact investing. So many of you who teach social entrepreneurship probably have maybe a module you're talking about impact investing, which is very, very hot and very tied to also um, really the hot topic of ESG uh, today. So, you know, blended value, again, is just what, what Mike Wright and, and Shakrazar were talking about, that blend of that financial, social, and, and environmental value. 
Also, within um, pretty much the last decade, uh, the work by Mike Porter, yes, the Mike Porter, um, and Mark Kramer coming up with this idea of shared value. And they both, these both authors, um, it really is basically, it was a, a 2011 uh, HBR article um, that grew very much in the, in, the, in the practitioner field. But they're really talking about what are the policies, what are the operating uh, practices, and they really get at the core of you know, competition. How do we be competitive by blending both the social, the environmental, um, and the financial <coughs> together? So it really is looking at how do we advance the company that we're advancing economic and also social conditions in the communities in which all of our organizations operate. Not only small businesses, but large medium large organizations too as well. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about some of some examples from this too as well. So shared value is very much the movement from very much being traditional, philanthropic, hey, we're an organization, we're an enterprise, we're gonna be giving money out, donations out, just to help a community. It's just gave it a kind of, pretty much a handout. And that maybe was very traditionally what many organizations were doing, okay? We started actually then started to see a movement to more aligned, where we're looking at some of the themes that are related to the company, but the objectives are not really tied to the strategy. Okay, so these may be like CSR, ESG movements that may be coming out of like fin finance, maybe coming out of HR departments, maybe coming out of marketing. Um, so, but they're not really related. They're not related to the overall, you know, in the C-suite, they may know a little bit of it. They may think it's great. They may think it's great for PR, but it's not really core to the strategy. Where shared value is really where corporate engagement right there is viewed and embedded within the overall company strategy, okay? And the idea is that, the idea is to create that shared value for both business and also society. So what, good, what is good for business is also good for society, what is good for society is also good for business, okay? And then they also kind of, and I won't talk too much about this, but they drilled down in terms of how they, it was measured kind of over time from the traditional to the aligned uh, to the shared value. And the shared value is really that impact of how we are going to influence the positive livelihoods of the people that are within our community that we work with, the products, the markets, the people we work with all the time. People we work with, but also the products and services that we also sell to these communities. Okay, so, and it can have an impact on business. You can think about new ways um, when you engage the community, new products, new markets, um, that can actually be developed. Okay, so you're really you're really sharing that value between, um, you know, what the what society wants and also what the business can actually do to achieve it, and have a gain, a positive financial gain for the for the company itself. Okay, and so they also so Mike Porter and and uh, Mark Kramer also talk a little bit about positive and negative uh, externalities that happen. So. You can see like a bi-directional influence in terms of overall company productivity and just a plethora of different things that can impact you know, an organization. So anytime you have poverty in the, in the company as community can have an impact on the overall performance of the organization. The quality of the education and the skills certainly can have impact on the type of workforce you have and the ability to be productive. Um, health and nutrition, of course. Uh, water use, energy use, environmental impact, and all have of it on them. And on the negative side, you could say that you know they talk about social deficits and in, 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 uh, environmental impact create economic costs for the company, and they've actually kind of shown that through some of their research. And also that some of the community weaknesses too, as well, can affect the company productivity too. On the positive side, social needs maybe represent a really great need for the organization to come up and be innovative about some of the new products and services that they can offer to the communities. Okay, so here's just some examples. This, ha this was actually back in uh, when HIV and AIDS in, in South Africa, when it was introduced, you know, a, a very for-profit organization, you know, global mining company, Anglo-American, uh, developed the first, you know, program to diagnose and treat it, and they wanted it to really protect their workforce and reduce absenteeism, okay? 
Um, so a lot of really good examples. I, I encourage you, if you really, if you want to know a little bit more about my Porter and, and Mark Kramer, feel free. I, I have their article. And they also have a site um, called blendedvalueinitiative.org or blendedvalueorg. Um, and they have great examples of organizations that have, um, you know, have used kind of uh, the blended value approach. And I'll dive into a little bit, uh, little bit more, uh, another one too as well, and how we can look at that. All right, so kind of just to sum it up, basically, um, at the very, very core of what they were talking about is competition. Okay, we talk about competition all the time in our entrepreneurship classrooms, but they are linked in terms of, can depend on some of the social conditions that we have. And like I mentioned before, you know, it can improve education and skills, safe working environments, sustainable use of, of natural resources too as well. And at the core also is that, you know, some of the organizations that we may be building within our classrooms, um, out, even outside of our classrooms, of course, you know, business can have really have, play a very much a fundamental role in solving some of the very large scale, intractable social problems that we have out there. Because they have the resources, many of them do, that let's say NGOs, government, do not have. And so, and they also can, you know, in terms of scaling and thinking deep, scaling wide in terms of solving a problem, um, they are kind of really at the forefront because they do have those resources. All right. So let's dive into a little bit here. Any questions, though, before I, I dive into another example, but then I also want to dive into some tools and techniques that you can use within your classrooms to bring more of a social lens. Um, sure. I don't know if we have to last an hour, but maybe I can. So, yep. fantastic what you're saying. Um, well, how does the, like, the conscious capitalism paradigm maybe connect with, with the social impact? Why do I ask this? Yeah. Because like, there's this dichotomy between teaching normal enter normal yeah. entrepreneurship and then the social. Shouldn't all entrepreneurship have this social aspect? And should it still be called the social entrepreneurship or maybe conscious or, or yeah, I, yeah, I'm not so sure on like on terms, but I'm advancing. I think we should I don't think everything should be all you know, entrepreneurship all social, but I think we should also we should have a lens to say okay, what is the opportunity for us beyond the economic impact that we can have with our organizations? What can we do for communities? What can we do for individuals in society to better their livelihoods? And that doesn't mean, I'm not gonna shove all social entrepreneurship down, but I think we do, I, I would like us to think a little bit more about what are some of the social implications that we could have as they're building out their ventures. And I think what we're seeing, I, I, I see this in the classroom, is that we do see students who do care about what the impact they have beyond just the pure economic you know, benefit that they're gonna have. All right, well, I'll dive into just an example um, of some work we did and partnership we did um, when the blended value um, idea was, when, when Mark Kramer and uh, Mike Porter were doing all of this. And this is a, more of a larger organization. But just an example of how they kind of used really some social entrepreneurship techniques uh, to kind of drive home their impact of what they wanted to do and how they were using the approach of, of Porter and Kramer. So they basically wanted to create, you know, kind of a new strategy where they wanted to look at, and there are multiple, multiple communities. And this is some of the work, um, I, I taught a course when I was at NYU Stern called Global Social Entrepreneurship Strategy. And we paired up with SAP, we paired up with the Foundation for Social Change, um, a number of other, uh, other partners too as well, I can't remember offhand. But we partnered with them to, to kind of help them, we were um, doing a trip to Bogota, Bogota and Medellin and we were also working in another organization, we were working with Barefoot Foundation too as well. Uh, but what SAP wanted to do is, you know, they were kind of relatively new to Colombia, and they really wanted to make a footprint in terms of some of the work they were doing with the community, and not just be just a, you know, an economic partner, basically. So they came up with, um, the, you know, they came up with the approach to social change. Let's build better communities in what we're trying to do. And they focused in, honed on three social issues to focus some of their resources on. OK, 
Okay, so they focused on things like basic needs, so everything uh, from food and shelter. They focused on education, education primarily for girls and also universities at the university level. And then they also focused on entrepreneurship and economic opportunity. And this was kind of outside the scope of the work they were, they were doing, but they were focusing in some work that they were doing um, in Ghana. So basically they put down, and, and they were building out, starting to build out more of a kind of a line type of structure before they moved over to a kind of a shared value. But they were really looking at what are the different types of resources that we can bring that we already have within, um, you know, within our area. How can we look at, you know, bring on technology donations, volunteer time, get employees, you know, uh, to, to work within a community, and also some cash resources too as well. Um, and so when they actually did this, they went through and they used, if you're very familiar with the theory of change, when you teach social entrepreneurship, they went through and they actually kind of drilled down what are all the different types of inputs? You know, what are the resources that we are actually going to provide to the community? What are some of the direct outputs we're going to have? And then let's actually blend both of you know, the shared outcomes and also the business outcomes and the impact. And how, how can we measure that in, in making sure that we're being effective on both sides? And so you can kind of see some of the direct outputs and all of that. But that was a framework that they started with. And so we started to kind of work with them a little bit in terms of how do we fill in those targets there? Okay, how do we address, how do we look at some of those social outcomes? How do we look at some of those, those business outcomes too as well? And again, we're looking at the three areas, the three strategic areas that they wanted to focus on, basic needs, education, and opportunity, okay? So when they drilled down, you know, basic needs up there, you can see the work we were involved in was more on the education side when we were in Columbia um, looking at girls. We were doing some kind of entrepreneurship boot camps um, right at the level of, of girls um, at the high school level. And so we, we trained, we actually trained many of the teachers. We, we use a lot of the SAP technology uh, to kind of help with the teaching and everything like that. Um, and you can see kind of some of the different type of social outcomes that we were looking at. We we're just, you know, measuring what are the number of girls that improve educational um, outcomes, you know, that some of their test scores kind of later on. This is some work that we can actually, and, and those of you who measure impact, you know that it takes quite some time from, you know, the initial kind of intervention and the work that you're doing on the ground to be able to see what is the progress that, that has actually been made. Um, so we can measure things like number of girls that graduate, number of girls in the workforce. They were very keen in terms of, you know, this was also, this is also kind of like a workforce development. Get women more into like STEM, get more women into the field of technology. And so this is really kind of in the, in the social part, great, you know, because they're educating, but they also really wanted them to be a part of, you know, their employees and part of the workforce. Um, so, and then you can also see some of the business type of outcomes too. Um, some of the impact on recruitment opportunities. Um, you know, even, even making, you know, when they did university students too, making future decision makers familiar with SAP products. So that's kind of like the business kind of end too. Um, but mirroring both of the both social um, and, and the business. And I'll have an example um, that you can use kind of in class that's very similar to this. Uh, based on the theory of change. Um, a couple different examples and ways that you can kind of use this to both highlight really the social economic um, and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and the social, yeah. So this one also is interesting too. Um, we were not involved in this, but we were, they were working with um, smallholder farmers in a SHAPE uh, project in Ghana. And they were working primarily with women entrepreneurs uh, and helping them actually develop their, um, their shea uh, business, shea tree business. Um, and so they're using some of the technology, some of the know-how, technical know-how of how actually to do that. And so all the different, you know, you can see really on this side, really all the different types of business outcomes that they had. They could scale the new products tailored to the, they were also working with the microfinance institutions too as well. They could also scale new platforms that really helped out the shareholder far farmers with the buyers. So connecting those two on the, on the business side. But then everything, the increase that they had, you know, on again, the livelihood of the women um, in the communities. Okay. All right. So 
Any questions before I go on to? I'm going to shift gears here and now talk about some tools and resources um, that you can use uh, within you know, a, a very fundamental uh, entrepreneurship class and really think about you know, some of the different ways that you can kind of infuse society and community problems you know, right within some of the work that they're doing, the ventures that they're starting. Speechless. Yeah, don't worry. So uh, before we change gears, yeah. I have a question from before. And the question is this. Let's say that we are successful in making all of our startups or entrepreneurs think about the social component or look at things through a social lens. Is there any danger that once they go past the startup stage, they become a legitimate established big corporation? Big corporation, yeah. Uh, that the social element gets lost, or do you think that by embedding it in the first stages of development, then it's done and it's there forever? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm for embedding it, especially if intentionality is uh, for sure more social. Um, there is a, you know, we talk about mission drift a lot in social entrepreneurship. And I think if it's sometimes an afterthought, it's not so, sometimes so intentional. It's kind of like, oh, that's a byproduct, wonderful byproduct of what we're doing. Maybe we should emphasize that. And sometimes that's not always kind of the right thing to do. We, we just closed out a, uh, a new venture seed competition. And we had, how many did, Monica, how many ventures did we have make the finals? Six. And then the semifinals, it was how many? I think it was six, something like 16. 16. Yeah, what was interesting, so I, I came to one of the boot camps in the semifinals and I said, we have money. We have money that we're giving away for, we have a social impact prize. We have up to 35,000. Um, and we really only of the 16, probably of what I saw, um, probably only two or three, you would say, are kind of would be the social entrepreneurship award, whatever. You know how many emails I got after that that were kind of like, oh, there's money here. This is great. Um, I think 10 out of the 16 I got. And they weren't, when you actually did a deep dive with them and you got on a Zoom call with them, and they weren't really, it was kind of like a one off. They're like, oh, my go to market strategy is going to be here, but eventually they're going to go, you know, elsewhere. And, you know, we're, we're serving this underserved community. Oh, are you? Is this really? Yeah. So um, I think the intentionality for a true social entrepreneurship venture has to be there. Um, but I, don't, I, I do think you can blend some. And I do think you have to be, just as you're measuring some of those outcomes, just making sure that you're not creating those negative externalities from the work that you're doing. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. How are you doing? I'm Mike Grimshaw at Cal State Dominguez. Um, we do a lot of social work uh, from, a, from a student standpoint. I'm, I'm interested uh, because my students generationally love to do things that help the community, yeah. and especially in the entrepreneurial world. And I'm curious, are you going to be going into this where you're actually showing how students can engage and actually do entrepreneurial projects and show results? and measure those results. I belong to an actus. I've been yeah. there about 10 years. And uh, I find that, you know, th that's very measurable and yeah. Yeah. very powerful. So thanks uh, yeah. for coming on that. Yeah, there, there might, I mean, some of the tools I think, um, I think can apply. And, and there might be more. We should have a conversation. Uh, because I'm really taking, I'm taking what I've kind of learned from the, on the social entrepreneurship side into the, I mean, this is not like a social entrepreneurship talk as much as it is like how we can rethink how, how we can do some of the social into our traditional. But I, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Let's see how, when, we, when I go through some of the exercises, see whether or not there are some parallels here in terms of some of the, the teachings that you do. Yeah, great, thank you. So as our students are going through kind of, you know, just the process of you know, designing, developing, and delivering, and looking at all of the different opportunities, um, what are some of the different tools? What are maybe some of the different practices? Even I, I'm maybe offering some templates too that you may want to look at and incorporate within the classroom. So um, I'm going to run through several of them, five or six of them actually, um, that I think are very applicable uh, to, to the traditional classroom. So we're all very familiar with the unique value proposition with more. Okay, I'm going to start off real basic here. Um, 
But looking at the unique value proposition, and at the very end, you know, it says, look at your benefit. What is a statement of your benefit? And I think there's multiple ways where you can look at what are the different multiple benefits that you have for your community, okay? And those could, of course, be economic, but they could also be social, they could be environmental, they could be cultural, they could be political uh, type of benefits. So that's one kind of very easy, I'm gonna start off with a very, very kind of easy tool, but have them start to kind of think a little bit more about that. Another one also um, really inspired by Heidi Neck at, at Babson, you know, she talks about the five practices of entrepreneurship education, the framework. And one of them actually is the practice of empathy, okay? And I know many of you who are teaching entrepreneurship and you're teaching, let's say, design thinking. The very, very first step of design thinking is the empathy phase, okay? And so we do this a lot in social entrepreneurship. It's like almost the, the forefront of, of when we get to work in the communities. We do a ton of this at the very beginning, a ton of listening, engaging with the community, understanding the community, co-creating with the community. So it's very, very important. The empathy piece is very, very important. And many of you, another one, you probably have used this before, um, using the empathy map canvas. And many of you probably have seen this, but it's so very, very important to really understand those needs you know, of your customers, of your end users. You know, what do they hear? What do they see? What do they say? What do they do? And I think by doing that, I think you're gonna have a better, more holistic understanding. And this is what we found in the social entrepreneurship field, of course have a better understanding of really, um, you know, really what are the needs, what are the desires, who, who is benefiting basically uh, from what you're maybe trying to do in the field. And so this is a very easy way. I, this is also, you know, students love to do this um, in social entrepreneurship, but also in traditional entrepreneurship when they do their personas. I'm not like a huge fan of personas all the time <laughs> um, because they're fun to do. Students love to do them because they get me really creative about, you know, who their you know, ideal customer is. Uh, but a lot of times it just narrows them even further down into what the potential of what their uh, customers or end users could be. So, um, so empathy is, is, is huge in, in social entrepreneurship, but I hope you're actually doing that too. Um, now going, let's get a little bit deeper into some of this. Um, so some of that work, of course, by Mark Kramer and, and, and Mike Porter were talking about with, uh, with shared value, and they were starting to use um, of course, in the SAP approach, they were using the theory of change. And I think using a modified theory of change, if you will, to really understand what could be some of the different types of outcomes that your students' ventures are trying to achieve. Okay? And it could be everything that, you know, traditional theory of change, again, what are the inputs, what are some of the resources that we have, what are the different types of activities, but I also like to say, from an entrepreneurship perspective, what are those core strategies that they're trying to do? Um, what are some of the direct products and immediate results from that? And then what are some of the outcomes too, okay? Both the positive, social, environmental, economic outcomes. Um, and we love to always look at outcomes. I'm a big, big believer in that because these are real-time measurable um, you know, results that you can, you can measure kind of in, within like a two to three year period. You don't have to wait too long to actually uh, measure the impact, which could be, you know, five to seven years from what you're trying to do. Um, and this also comes from, uh, this is not work that's, you know, theory of change has been out there for some time. Um, when we were working with, uh, we were working with McKenzie a number of years ago, where we were actually trying to understand not only how nonprofits, but for-profit enterprises were measuring their impact too, they were adopting this framework, and they were adopting the framework around outcomes as real-time proxies for real-time, for, for learning uh, for organizations. So McKinsey had a very keen interest in really understanding the theory of change for their for-profit organizations. Okay. So one way also to think about it is, um, and this is kind of a template that I give my students, both within social entrepreneurship, but I also think you could do it in the traditional uh, entrepreneurship classroom, um, is kind of flipping this around and looking at the theory of change. And this is by Jason Sal from Mission Measurement, um, who's been one of, our, one of our keynote speakers a number of years in our conference. Um, but he looks at in terms of, okay, let's take at the top, what are the things that we want to influence 
with the work that we do. Okay, what are the different times? You know, change in status, behavior, conditions. Okay, and at the very bottom, what I love is that he's really looking at a very you know a strategic framework for any type of organization. So, what are some of those key strategies? So, what are the different type of programs, activities that we are offering? Um, you know, for the community. Okay, or for you know, the people who are benefiting from our products and services as an entrepreneur. And then in the middle, basically, you can drill down is how are we measuring? Are we being effective in actually achieving um, some of those outcomes? And so you'll get some of the indicators. So it's very, very similar you know, to that approach, you know, the SAP, when they are looking at some of the, the, the social and the business uh, indicators approach. Okay, all right. Another tool also kind of in practice, um, this is actually some work again that we were doing uh, in Colombia with an organization called Pazamanos. Um, and they were an organization, um, and again, this was part of a class I taught in Global Social Impact Strategy. Um, and they essentially was a, you know, a team of MBA students uh, interested in social impact. And we were working with Pazamanos to help them deliver, um, they were a program, they were in the community, working with youth in the community to get them off the streets, get them off of crime and what have you. And so um, we use kind of a little bit of a framework. And again, this was a traditional you know, business, you know, entrepreneurship uh, course. We looked at, again, we took a value proposition, took a value proposition exercise that I mentioned earlier before. We went through and we looked at, let's, let's tease out what we believe our value proposition is what are actually some of the outcomes that can be related to that value proposition that we have? And then what are some of the indicators that we can easily measure almost on a day-to-day -day basis about how we are actually doing and how we're progressing? So this is a long one, but the value proposition for them is for vulnerable communities, this is my MBA students putting the value proposition out. So for vulnerable communities affected by violence, we target the root of social problems through psychosocial and artistic mentoring, workshops and interventions, which aim to strengthen the civic culture by eliminating, so this is the value propositions here. We wanna eliminate the social acceptance of violence that's within those communities and motivating planning for a better future. So we're teasing out essentially the value proposition of eliminating social acceptance of violence and motivating planning uh, for the future. And so we can see here in terms of all the different types of outcomes that we may have tied to that value proposition. So we want youth to acquire new socialization skills. We want the youth to also learn importance of uh, peaceful uh, coexistence. And then you can see some of the different indicators that when we go out in the field and we start measuring our impact and really understanding our community, we can go in and we can talk to the youth, we can talk to the parents, we can talk to the teachers, we can do one-on-one -on -one surveys, you know, we can do, focus groups, just having dialogues and conversations uh, with them to, to measure that. So that's one way of kind of blending, taking a viewpoint of take the unique value proposition, tear that down of what you have, and then looking at some of the positive outcomes that you may have, both on the business and both on the social as we've seen before, to be able to do that. Okay, all right, and then finally, uh, well a couple more here, and this is, uh, Another one, if you want to look at your competition a little bit differently, <laughs> this is another way we have, our, we have our students actually do, you know, a power grid or what have you. Um, this is an impact gaps canvas. And this is very much, you know, when we talk about competition, we look at, okay, what are some of the existing problems that are out there, right? Um, that's on the left-hand side. Um, and then what are some of the different solutions that are out there, okay? Who's providing what? How are they providing it? What are the unique features? What are the unique benefits that they have? And you can kind of work through, this is a kind of a fun exercise with the students to really think about, and they have questions here about what are some of the unaddressed obstacles. So, so you want to find the gaps between what is currently there and what, or what are the problems are, what, who's currently solving it, but who's maybe not, it's not solving it entirely. What are some opportunities for you as a venture to come in? Um, just like with anything in your competition, what are some of your, your strengths and how are you going to tackle some of the different you know, opportunities. So they really go down and they drill down into um, you know, some questions that you can basically go through and ask. You know, what is, what's working, what's not working? Um, how can you improve it? 
Uh, what are the specific you know, key opportunities? Could they be market-based? Could they be regulation, education, partnership, and what have you? And then what are some key insights kind of from that? And that can really also help you not only when you're looking at your competition, but how do you do it differently? How can you improve what you're currently doing um, as well? Okay, and then this is kind of the blank canvas that you kind of, you start from. But you give them the first one, um, and then they go ahead and they look at um, the gaps within. Okay, <laughs> and then finally, you know, a very hot topic these days um, is ESG. And really some of the opportunities that may be out there, you know, of course, you know, it's one, we talk about ESG strategy, um, what it is to attract a workforce, um, especially those that are dedicated to upheelds, you know, some of the, you know, the different type of social, government, environmental um, issues that we're, you know, that many of our students are very passionate about. Um, you know, can create a corporate brand that's appealing to multiple different types of consumers. It can also attract the different types of a wide range of investors, not only traditional investors, but also, again, in the field, impact investing is very hot these days. Um, and what is kind of cool is, you know, according to World Economic Forum, and this is some data I found, 68% of startups are now integrating some type of ESG from day one. I thought that was very interesting. I thought that was pretty high. When you say, yeah, that is, it seems to be kind of high. Um, but it may be, you know, they're, maybe they're doing one component or two components of it, if you will. Um, so some of the things that, you know, with your students to, to think about what are some of the different type of metrics that we may want to consider. Um, it could be a whole host of things from your carbon footprint reduction to your energy efficiency um, improvements, employee health and safety, uh, product safety, getting into diverse board of, of, of directors, and also any of your DEI efforts too as well. So we do a lot. Um, not only, I use, I have a couple cases here. I don't know where, Jeremy Dan is here, who's our, our case director. I think you see, I thought I saw Jeremy here, but you'll, you'll, you'll have a chance to meet him very soon. Um, but this was a case that we did, and I use this within, um, within the traditional classroom. A little bit on uh, Los Angeles has a clean tech incubator, um, and talking a little bit about how they infuse within their traditional startups some of their DEI initiatives and how they actually measure it um, and they actually have an earn back pay, uh, pay uh, program that you actually, if you meet some of these metrics, um, you actually then uh, get somebody earned back from the stock that you have. So um, kind of really cool. So, all right. And then finally, um, another exercise, a little bit inspired um, uh, by some of, the, some of the work by Heidi Neck, um, is an ESG exercise that you can do with your students. Um, and you essentially have them Choose two of the 17 uh, SDG goals. And how, you ask them the question, how can you implement um, the adoption of the UN SDGs um, in your own opportunities? So any of the ventures that they are working in, the ideas that they're working on. And then have them consider what is the economic, what's the social value that can be created by including them, okay? And you can have them, have them choose two, you can have them choose four, or whatever, it depends on just how ambitious um, they want to be, okay? So it's really cool. Yeah, UN SDGs reflect 12 trillion uh, in business opportunities. And a kind of cool framework bringing kind of everything together in this exercise is you could use something like this. And remember I, ta I told you a little bit about um, Gothenburg and the work that they were doing, the free assessment tool. Well, this is it, basically. And it kind of brings together, you could use this kind of canvas um, if you will, label in what is the SDG goal, what is it delivered by, what's the program name, who are your partners, what are the steps that you actually along the way um, need to incorporate, what's a social value, okay, what's a social value, but then here what I love too is also that business value and how that's being created. Okay. So with that one minute, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Jill, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, in our, uh, the, when we designed this conference, we wanted it for entrepreneurship educators and entrepreneurship researchers. And um, um, so with our thought with asking Jill to do our opening keynote and to focus on this important topic of social entrepreneurship, um, uh, you know the emphasis that the AACSB 
is, is yeah. focusing on. And so I wanted Jill to share with you some ideas for our researchers in the audience about establishing the framework, learning what others have done in the field so that we could be building off of that with, with uh, future research based on what, um, what we've done in the past. And Jill, thank you thank for you. giving us that kind of an overview. And I also want people walking out of our conference with ideas that they could take back into the classroom, the tools that you can be using to really deepen our students' appreciation and engagement and re-engagement in, uh, in making social impact. So Jill gave us some uh, great tools to use. Uh, we'll put them up on our Whova app uh, so if you for this kind of a presentation. So uh, you can see some of those tools and then follow up with Jill. Our conference is kicked off. Thank you so much, Jill, uh, for your inspiring talk. All right. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>